Welcome to Frames Bar. What can I get you? I'm gonna keep it simple today and just have one of these. Mm. Nothing fancy, but it does the job. Today I wanted to talk about a bunch of things actually. This week I've been playing a lot of Guilty Gear, a lot of Tekken, and even a little bit of Virtua Fighter. And some Smash Brothers actually. I probably played more different fighting games this week than any week in my life possibly. But I think we should start by talking a bit about um, the most recent installments of Harada's Bar. Now, the idea of Frames Bar isn't going to be that I just, you know... Um, reference or talk about or spin off on what happens in Harada's Bar, even though, of course, the initial video was uh, a bit of a parody on that concept. I actually really wanted Namco and Harada to make something like Harada's Bar. I'd talked about it in the past, and I was really happy when I saw it, but when I watched the first episode, I sort of realized that, okay, this is just another controlled environment where the people at Namco can completely dictate the narrative and they can, you know, say whatever they want. There's not going to be a person in the bar who goes, well, what about this and contradicts something because of how you have to culturally defer to um, power and eminence in Japanese culture. It's just the way it works here. There's not really space left culturally or cognitively for anything else. And so I thought, you know, if people are going to watch this and take whatever they say at face value, then it's very one-sided. Maybe there should be a bit of a, a black mirror or a foil to this, somebody to play devil's advocate. So I made my first, you know, frames bar video as a joke, but then I kept going. So... I'm going to talk about a bunch of things, but I think I want to keep abreast, at least, um, of what happens in Harada's Bar, because it is a, a fascinating phenomenon in terms of fighting game developer communication. And last time uh, we gathered here, um, you and I, dear listener, we talked about that episode of Harada's Bar where they talked about uh, netcode and how, you know, that uh, video and that audio wasn't exactly well received. And I've heard from my own viewers and comments, although I haven't confirmed it myself, that that video has since become um, unlisted or privated. It's not around anymore as far as I understand. So apparently the backlash was big enough that they decided to get rid of it for now. Which... Um, it's kind of sad. I've had to do that maybe two or three times since I made my own uh, YouTube channel, and it's not an easy thing. Basically, when you have a YouTube video that is getting such a negative response that you decide to remove the video, um, it's a bit of a scary experience. It happened one time when I made, because um, I used to make character guides a lot for tech, and that's sort of the foundation that this channel was built on. I made, you know, these 30, 40 minute guides to all the characters, which looking back now, you know, they were informative enough if you wanted to know some frame data. But then again, you know, I made one on Brian and I've never really played a match as Brian in my life. And I refuse to because he's a character for um, chronic bitches. But um, I made one on Akuma and I really tried hard to make it good, you know, because I don't play 2D fighting games. I played Third Strike, you know, a couple of times, but I don't really know a lot about Akuma or 2D games. Uh, definitely didn't back then at least and so I wanted to understand you know what is um, uh, FADC and how do all these specials work and I read all these posts and, and forums and I uh, messed around in practice mode until I could do half decent Akuma combos myself but then when the guide went up even though there were all these disclaimers you know I'm not an expert on this character but this is you know how I understand him I had like you know 30 dislikes right away um, more likes than dislikes, of course, you know, that my viewership is so generous and kind. They're always very cool to me, but it was like a lot of dislikes and people saying, you obviously don't really know what you're talking about here. Um, and so I decided to take that video down. And then people, you know, go, oh, you removed your video, you know, and they, you know, want you to comment on that. And um, my strategy is always, I just, you know, like a, a dog or a cat just laying down flat on the floor, do whatever you want to me. 
um, like a wolf submitting to the alpha. Okay, I made something that wasn't good enough. I'm sorry. Do what you will. And so far, you know, I've gotten away with um, any any hiccup I might have, have been responsible for. The other time I made, um, it was a video I was honestly kind of excited about because I get these comments saying, you know, I listen to your videos before I go to bed. I like to listen to your voice before I fall asleep or something like that. And honestly, those comments are some of the comments that mean the most to me because I'm... Um, and I have been an insomniac for a long time and I have my own YouTube channels and videos and voices that I go to when I need something to sort of soothe me a bit. You know, that's been been kind of big in my life. I used to do a lot of uh, night work or night shifts here in Japan and my, my sleep pattern was, um, you know, completely crazy. And so the fact that somebody will listen to me and that will sort of, you know, help them through um, a bit of a rough patch at night that's actually um, it's very flattering to me so I wanted to make something long that you can you know put on and it's not gonna end 10-15 minutes in you can keep it on and know that you know maybe you'll be able to fall asleep somewhere along the way and in that video I just did a, a tier list which is a good like meme jokey thing because as far as I'm concerned I mean you know if you watch my videos that I basically consider tier lists jokes at this point that's why I made the infinity tier list so I never have to make another tier list video that doesn't mean that I don't have like strong opinions about balance being bad in the fighting games that I play I mean there are still problems with Tekken and even though I'm not a high level guilty gear player yet just looking at the numbers i can tell you that soul is in fact a huge problem in guilty gear strive and there's going to be some sort of adjustment hopefully to him but it's like you know um when you make a tier list video hopefully i mean uh the people who watch my videos they're sort of in on the joke they know that i'm doing it sort of ironically but um that video was a, a character design um, tier list video so it's like how do I feel about not the balance you know it's not about who's strong and who's weak is how what do I feel about the ideas that went into making this character so for example you know that I really love the design of Miguel because I feel he's supposed to be untrained powerful strong um, low discipline high power and I think that's fun and it's communicated well by his um, visual design and then it's communicated well by his attack animations and sound cues so that's an example of a design that i think is really good in this game but for example um i said that i don't i'm not super excited about the idea of lily and it's not that there aren't like these graceful cool ideas that went into making her attacks it's just the the blonde rich privileged um european girl with a butler who drinks black tea and talks about drinking black tea and talks about having a rich dad it's been done so many times and it's such a you know a, a packaged and done concept in japanese media that it doesn't get any points for creativity same thing with like zafina who's super cool in tekken but the the mysterious fortune teller with a crystal ball who kind of knows magic and you know that's been done many times as well there's rose there's viola there's Manant, i guess now in street fighter and so on so it was just supposed to be a whatever video where i talk about something where it's kind of a joke and it doesn't really matter but you can turn it on and it's me talking about tekken for a long time and maybe that will get you through a, a lunch break at work when you're trying to reset before you go back um, to your job that you hate god knows i i know how that feels or you know falling asleep at night or whatever but i uploaded that video and because it was a tier list and because you know people skip ahead i guess you know i'm this is complete contradiction i might be wrong maybe you know i sound like a dipshit and people hated the, the video for completely valid reasons but it was kind of like um you know how can you put the design of this character below this you know it it, it became very um the opposite of what i wanted it to be something that wasn't at all serious but the, the opinions were taken um seriously and so it got a lot of dislikes and i was like um you know i'll i'll take this video down not because i couldn't stand for what i said in it but it's like you know if my goal was to make something that people can calm down and listen to without thinking too much what i've done instead is i've created something that people 
think a lot about and feel strongly about and so it's not the soothing thing that I hoped it would be so for the purposes that I intended for the video it was a failure and that's why I decided to get rid of it so you know I'm 10 minutes into this episode but what I'm trying to say is just that I sympathize with the fact that Harada um, had to take down or private his video and that it didn't go well but he talks about that in his um, latest installation of Harada's Bar, he refers back to it, and he, um, I mean, how, how much slack should I cut him? How fair should I be? How much of the benefit of the doubt should be given? Um, he comes across as very humble and fair in this last video, and I really enjoyed watching it, but he kind of says, you know, to his editor or whoever is filming him that, you know, this is all your fault because you fucked up in the editing and I came across as an asshole even though I'm not kind of a vibe. Uh, and the editor is kind of laughing and going, yeah, you're right, ha ha ha, you know, referring up or, you know, whatever it is, but... You know, maybe that's fair enough. Maybe he felt like because of the subtitles, because of the language barrier or whatever, um, his words were uh, misinterpreted and um, that's why that happened. I have to say something though. I don't know who does the subtitles for these Harada's Bar episodes, but they are very, very good as someone who speaks both languages and has had to create subt subtitles both ways in the past. Um, it's very well done, like not only the words, but the nuance goes through very well most of the time. And that's not easy because Japanese and English are not two languages that translate directly into one another well at all. If you're working with French and English, for example, I mean, half of the English words are French already because of, you know, William the Conqueror and all the rest of it. But, you know, European languages that share DNA, whether the, whether the Romans languages, I think Swedish trans, uh, translates well into uh, German because we both have, you know, Teutonic DNA, I guess. But it's like uh, Japanese and English that doesn't exist at all. So you might have a word that just doesn't have an equivalent or a good one in the other language. And then the grammatical structure is way off. So you have to get creative and whoever is getting creative with this is doing a good job. I think it might be, if I'm going to be honest, I don't know. I think it might be, um, Michael Murray. And the, the reason I say that is that I know he works at Namco and he's very good at both languages, but um, there's an example in this last Harada's Bar episode where they say, you know, saying somebody's name Chin, you know, you've probably heard of uh, Harada-san or, um, you know, Chang or, or stuff like that in Japanese before. When you say Chin, it's a version of that, but it's very affectionate. It's very, you know, it's an intimate way of addressing somebody. It's somebody that you know and that you like. Uh, don't necessarily look up to very much, but like. Um, and the example that the translator um, uses in the subtitles is it's like calling somebody named Michael, uh, Mikey. So that just made me feel like maybe, you know, it's Michael Murray doing this and he uses his own name as, you know, an example. I could be completely wrong, but for whoever is doing the subtitles, they're doing a very, very good job and I'm impressed by them. So if you're worried about, you know, I've gotten these comments a lot, like maybe it's a mistranslation, maybe the subtitles don't get the whole message across. Rest assured that most of the time what you're seeing in the subtitles is actually a very, very good um, depiction or interpretation of what is actually being said. And they're doing a very good job with it. Um, so yeah, in this last video, it's uh, a casting video. Uh, Harada is on the casting couch and he's talking about the different people they're going to have on Harada's bar in the future. Kind of, you know, uh, um, a list of potential guests or members or whatever. And they talk about these different people. It's actually kind of interesting because if I had, you know, a, a Tekken podcast, I kind of do not only where I have guests, but I've been on Wave Dash. For all of those uh, out there who keep asking, you know, when the next Wave Dash is going to be because you enjoyed those, thank you so very much, by the way. I mean, they were so fun to make because it's, you know, one of the few times where I've really felt like, I don't know, connected with Tekken at large, sitting there with all these really um, famous and talented people and, you know, people live in the chat and, and thousands of people watching. Um, that's all something that is being, um, created and, and, uh, helmed by Arya, you know, 
the uh, the blasted and 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 eminent and exalted salami and uh, it's entirely up to him and basically when he decides to do an episode he uh, gets in touch with those of us who are regular contributors and he asks you know who's available if i say you know i can't do this day i might be able to do saturday maybe he will adjust maybe he will you know get somebody else but it's sort of up to him i know he's been talking about doing new episodes soon and uh we've talked about you know me going on there and having other people on as well so i don't know what what's happening but i'm pretty sure that there's going to be something soon and if i'm available and if it is at all possible for me to to be on then i will go on because i've always found that uh, really really fun you know it's very different from what i usually do um with my own channel but if i had a podcast like that i wouldn't you know uh, sit around and think about who might be a potential member that maybe I could contact. I would kind of get people, and then if we were all different and we all, you know, said uh, different things, and it was, you know, it wasn't um, pre-planned that heavily. I think that might turn into better content because then you have, you know, opposing views, and 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 there's a, a potential for something interesting to happen there, you know. But that's not really the Japanese way. In Japan, you want everything to be as predictable as possible because it needs needs to be neatly labeled and packaged and it needs to fit neatly into um, a, a box and a category. Otherwise, it just doesn't jive with anything um, over here uh, on these islands. So, But he, he, he talks about, you know, how... Um, he talks about his wedding, which I thought was actually lovely, and how, you know, Sakurai, you know, from Smash Brothers and Ono and all these guys showed up, and he said, you know, if a, if a meteorite fell on um, the place where we were doing the wedding, then, you know, Japanese games would be gone. I think he talked about, you know, producers for um, Final Fantasy and Kingdom Hearts and everything, you know. Um, if, if we all went up and smoked, then the Japanese uh, gaming industry would be in peril. But I honestly thought it was kind of lovely, but it also shows you that, you know, these people, um, they interact, they know uh, each other, and they exist in some sort of dynamic, which, you know, there's a power dynamic in there because it is Japan, but, you know, it kind of explains why these, these guest character things are happening uh, back and forth. Speaking of which... Kazuya is in Smash Brothers. Maybe I should comment on that. You know what I think about that briefly. Um, uh, what usually happens with these announcements is I have, I've said it in so many videos when they announced Zafina and Season 4 and Kunimitsu and even Lydia. I was sleeping, exhausted, knocked out from work. Um, or enjoying too many refreshments and then somebody wakes me up with a message or a call one of my friends who does fighting games and says you know you have to watch this or did you see what happened and same thing happened this time cause yeah, it's in smash um i'm not that excited about it because um guest characters i've talked about it before it's it's not a thing that i mean it's easy to get hype about it but i'm careful about getting too hype about it because i'm more interested in what it does for the uh, the balance and the competitive viability of the game more than the, the hype and the sales that the trailers are going to generate. Uh, but then Kazuya is also by far one of the Tekken characters that I am the least interested in. I'm not a Mishima guy. I understand what he represents for the franchise and, 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 and you know, Tekken. I understand that he is, uh, for better or worse, our mascot. But if Elisa or Miguel or Zafina or Leo or Bob... Um, or, you know, even King or Yoshi showed up in Smash, I think that would have been really, really cool, and I might uh, try it out. My girlfriend uh, plays Switch, and she has Smash Brothers. I actually bought her Smash Brothers because she's uh, she hangs out with friends and has parties, you know, with her workmates, and they want to do party games, so they play Smash Brothers at night. Um, and uh, sometimes, I, I guess, I join in, even though I'm not a... Uh, uh, a big Smash Brothers player. Maybe I am. I played Melee. You're not to know this, but I played Melee and Brawl for like years and years and years. It was like the go-to party game for me and my friends um, back in Sweden when I was in like, you know, um, high school. So a long time ago. And here's a, an indication of how shitty I was. There was this guy. Um, I'm going to tell you stories about this guy sometime because he was um, a, a a big sort of character and influence in my life, Al, 
but Al won pretty much every single match we ever played of Smash Brothers. He was so much better than everybody else, and one day after like years and years and years of losing to him in Smash Brothers, I just asked him, how the fuck do you win so much more than me? I'm obviously trying harder. And he um, finally decided to let the rest of us know that he was the only one who had figured out DI. The rest of us didn't know that it existed because we didn't watch videos on Smash Brothers. We didn't try to, you know, like um, learn academically how to get better at it. But he just knew that if he held a certain direction when he got knocked in the air, he was going to be able to prevent himself from being KO'd. The rest of us, when we got hit by a big move, we just let go of the controller and died. So he basically had, I mean, it's the equivalent of having twice the amount of HP in tech. And you can just imagine how much better that would make you. And it was like, oh God, okay. That makes sense then. And now, you know, that I'm into fighting games. I mean, long after that, I got into Tekken. Now I know um, uh, a bit about Smash Brothers. I watch um, tournaments sometimes. It's weird. Even though I don't play the game, I think it's actually a really interesting spectator game. I think it it, it plays well uh, in terms of entertainment, at least. Um, but, you know, not using DI, <laughs> you're not going to get very far. Um, speaking of different fighting games, I hope uh, my viewers aren't upset with me for not uh, playing exclusively Tekken right now, but getting really deep into Guilty Gear as well. I think ultimately it's going to be healthy for me and the channel because you know how uh, content creators and streamers, they uh, sometimes take breaks and they need to, to get away for a bit. Excuse me. I'm going to have another drink. Mmm. Feel free to do the same, but um, I'm not taking a break, obviously, from making videos or anything like that. Um, it's just, I think, healthy to play something different every once in a while. You know, um, before I got really into Tekken and had the channel, I played all kinds of different video games all the time. But now it's like, not only do I enjoy playing Tekken, I also want to make content for it. So it's the game I end up playing 99% of the time when I want to play video games in my spare time. But it also kind of, you know, sours your uh, your view and your perspective a little bit and there it's certainly a thing that's been happening with my channel and with some other content creators i mean look at the main man um he definitely i mean um his sort of love for the game kind of comes and goes it waxes and wanes because it's like an ongoing relationship with a lover almost you know how if you've ever been in like a a real long-term relationship with uh, somebody it's it's not something that is always going to be stable at the at the same level of like emotional positivity or negativity it always comes and goes and I think you know if you're you're going to be successful if you want to be with somebody long term it's about navigating that and accepting the fact that that's the way it is but that's kind of the way I think we end up feeling about our f uh, favorite fighting games because we play them so much and that's why we end up making videos where we like lament the direction things are going and you know we feel powerless because we're just consumers and unlike Harada and Namco, we don't really have any influence on what's going to be happening with the franchise. But um, I think it's actually going to improve uh, my positivity about Tekken and my gameplay with Tekken. Anytime I've taken a long break and played a really difficult game before, even if it's not a fighting game, you know, when I take a break and I get really into Bloodborne, which happens about one one time every year i you know play through the old dark souls games or bloodborne and i do a new build and i try to get really good and i try and like you know perfect the orphan of cause um and i come back to tech and it's almost like things are a little bit crisper and fresher it's kind of like resetting your swing i don't know if you if you've ever played golf um i hate golf i think it's a, a really stupid game that I don't enjoy at all. Sorry if you do enjoy golf, but I was kind of forced to play it a bit by my parents when I was young. And the thing about golf is like when you're swing, um, when you're trying to hit the ball, if things are going wrong, if you just stand there and try and like get better and try to improve, um, you're going to kind of make the same mistake over and over and over again because you're trying so hard to get it right but something is off and so you're kind of hammering the mistake into your muscle memory so what you need to do is reset basically relearn from scratch how to swing a golf club 
and I think it's really similar in Tekken when I've had those um, periods in fighting games where I just lose for a week. I get demoted to like a rank that is way below what I'm supposed to be capable of with a character that I'm supposed to be good with and I'm losing to things that I shouldn't be losing to and you kind of lose faith, you know, in yourself. Um, and if you don't think that happens to like high level players and competitors, um, I mean, of, of course it does. It happens to everybody. I've talked to some of the best players in the world and they have those 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 periods. But um, what I try, try to do is like gain completely fresh perspective and, and get back to it from a completely new angle. Um, one way to do that is to just to learn a character that I've never played before and that plays in a different way. And then that usually helps me out. But um, I really am enjoying Guilty Gear right now. I've been trying to find a main character, which has been hard because I like Giovanna, but she's also, I mean, it's obvious even to me as new as I am that she's so extremely basic that it's almost insulting because you, I mean, within two hours of looking at her, I could do like optimal combos and play her reasonably well, but I try and like understand how to do um, aerial combos with Melia or how to play um, Zato 1 or Zato Ichi. Or um, I'm trying to play a bit of, of Faust. I've gotten really into Faust or just, you know, forward three or forward um, kick, I guess, you know, into Potemkin Buster, those things. It's it's so much harder and so much more complex that uh, I feel like I'm missing out on 80% of the, the depth that, that game has if I'm just playing Giovanna. So I'm, I'm pretty much settled right now on Faust. I actually played him all day yesterday. Um, really cool character design, really inspired animations, but really weird. Now people are telling me that he's super low tier and that he's kind of shitty, but you know, that's sort of my life. I don't really play good characters, do I? Um, the one exception maybe being Zafin and Tekken. I tried Virtua Fighter as well, uh, and maybe I should just mention quickly what I thought about it. I've said before that I wasn't going to try that game because when I looked and listened to it, it just felt... Um, I mean, the, the the presentation was just really unappealing because I thought the, the uh, animations looked awkward, the physics looked awkward, uh, the sound effects were awkward, and the character design was kind of bland. It, it kind of looked like, you know, dudes standing around in... Uh, in awkward clothes kind of a thing. It didn't really, you know, have that immersion quality that isn't, you know, it's not integral to uh, whether or not a fighting game is enjoyable or deep or good, but it is like really important for getting people into the game. Um, and I think the best example of that we've ever had is like Marvel Infinite. I've goofed on Marvel Infinite, even though I've never really played, I think, a Marvel versus Capcom game. But um, people who really love Marvel, and trust me, people love Marvel. Like that community is like... Marvel 3, I think especially, has meant so much to so many people. It's like the, the star that they orbit when it comes to fighting games, even though they have to play other things these days. Um, <laughs> Ares tells that great story. I mean, depending on how you look at it, it might be kind of sad, but you know, uh, Marvel players used to get so fucking hype at tournaments that it was like they were um, freaking out. And this one guy was getting so hype about Marvel that he was basically like shaking and people just thought he was super hype, but it turned out he was actually having a seizure. Um, which again, it's, it's sad. Somebody was having a medical emergency and I really hope um, he's fine and it went well, but you know, people love that game so much that you can't even distinguish somebody, you know, having a seizure and just being super excited about the game. But Marvel Infinite, according to the Marvel players, was like um, a really deep and cool game with a lot of good ideas, just the right amount of like new stuff, new ideas and new things that you would want from a game in that franchise. But, but I think mainly because the presentation was so lackluster, it just ended up uh, landing wrong with its audience. And the other thing is that you have that, I mean, uh, Maximilian dude has been talking about it recently, you know, it's an ongoing topic in fighting games all the time. You've got the competitive players and then you've got the um, uh, casual audience, but the casual audience, they make up such a large uh, part or portion of the consumer base that you have to have them on your side. Otherwise, your fighting game isn't going to do well. So you need to appeal to both and fighting 
finding the balance is the entire trick. If the competitive players and the veteran players aren't happy, then they're not going to advertise your game for free for years by creating all this content and these guides and appearing in tournaments. But, you know, um, the casual players still need to uh, be able to play single player modes and, and, and mess around in low ranks uh, and have an enjoyable uh, consumer experience where they feel they got their money's worth, you know. Um, so it, it's interesting how it seems to be that sort of a balance and and it's it seems to be whether you're talking about Guilty Gear or Tekken um, or any other fighting game that it's it's trickling more and more towards becoming more consumer friendly um, for beginners because that's where the bulk of the money is and the veterans what are what are they going to do Tekken players are going to play Tekken almost no matter what almost no matter what so we just make the game simpler and simpler but what does that mean long term and, and all the rest of it i mean it's not a it's not a problem we're going to solve together in this video but uh yeah marvel infinite seems to have failed i think mainly because of a lack of of presentation and it's kind of sad because i would love for there to be a landscape of franchises out there um, and one of the reasons I decided that I wanted to try and get like seriously good at Guilty Gear, I'm not trying to like fuck around in this game for a week and then abandon it. I want to get to a level where I'm at least a reasonable, if not impressive, competitive player because fighting games is like this interesting world of a bunch of games. And if you're just playing the, the one game, in my case, Tekken, it's... it's um, I mean, it's going to probably mean long term that you're more focused and oriented and skilled at that one game. But it also means that whatever happens to that game, you're sort of confined to it. It reminds me of this is a tangent, but um, I don't know if I've talked about this before, but I'm a huge fan of The Lord of the Rings, um, the books and the films. I think the films are amazing and, and some of the best film adaptations ever made of anything, probably. Um, but I'm a huge fan of the, the lore in the books as well. And there's this idea, I mean, it's the, the theme of the entire second age of Middle-earth, but, but humans um, who are Edine, the Edine, um, or you could, the Eruhini are sort of the children of the, the main creator god of that universe. And the Eruhini are the, um, the humans and then the elves. But the humans and elves are kind of different, where the elves are... Um, immortal they don't die unless something really sad happens around them they can die from like um emotional stress they can die from the world around them darkening because they are sort of tied to the soul and the the essence of the world that they live in or they can be killed but they don't die from old age whereas the humans do and when the elves die they go to to Amon to Valin or to the halls of Mandos where they're kind of eventually resurrected so they are immortal even if they are killed whereas humans nobody really knows what happens to them and so the humans in the second age the men of Numenor um who Aragorn is descended from by the way that's why he you know is very I think he's in his 80s or 90s um during the the events of the Lord of the Rings He's descended from a, an exalted, very special bloodline of humans. But the men of Numenor, the reason they um, fell is that they started to covet this gift of immortality. But what the um, the, the Valar, the gods of, of the West and the elves try and teach them is that it's kind of a gift that you have. You have this option of dropping off the, the board and not being part of the game anymore. You can sort of be in control of your own destiny and you have a way out. There's an ex exit called death, whereas, you know, we are sort of tied to the fate of whatever happens to this world and we have to suffer along with it um, no matter what happens. Um, I know that's a, um, a drawn out and, and strange analogy, but my point is kind of if you only play one fighting game and you, you don't even consider alternatives, then if that game gets better or worse, then your experiences are going to get better or worse. And I would like um, for it to be the case that I have, you know, a bit of, of breadth. Um, another thing that I will say here is that, um, I mean, my favorite video game franchise of all time apart from Tekken, possibly even above Tekken, uh, I've said this before, is Diablo. And um, Diablo 3 is getting a new season soon. 
And the new seasonal theme, they have a new theme for every season, you know, they do this in, in Path of Exile as well, is that they're going to bring back some of the classic weapons uh, from Diablo 2, which is, you know, in my top three favorite games of all time. I've probably played that game for thousands of hours. I play it every year. I reinstall Diablo 2 and I make, um, you know, summoning... A necromancer and I go and resurrect or revive some Erdar and I do Uber Trestrum, my favorite classes. I play the Druid and I do, you know, an elemental druid with fissure, then I respec about halfway through Nightmare into a wind druid and I threw you know throw cyclones. That's gonna make sense to you if you play Diablo 2, not if you don't, but um uh, that new season is is really really fun because it's Diablo 3 which is a game that I love and really um, uh, enjoy playing but it's also a callback to a game that I think is even better which is Diablo 2 and there's going to be Diablo 2 resurrected um, pretty soon so I want to make videos about that as well and my uh, my content's gonna take um, a bit of a turn and my tech and loving viewership might not respond to it uh, as positively as I would like, but I think it's good for me and the channel long term that I do whatever the fuck I feel like doing um, as long as my heart is in it, because I that's what I've done so far. And so far, it's kind of worked, you know, so far, I haven't made a video that I didn't feel was right. I didn't, you know, um, shy away from saying something that I, I was... Uh, uh, worried about, you know, um, saying. I've just tried to be as honest as possible, and it's really worked so far. It, it's worked well, so and that's what I'm going to keep on doing. In the last episode of Frames Bar, I mentioned briefly that I've had a couple of run-ins with the Yakuza since I've been here, you know, organized Japanese crime, which some people seem to be interested in, but it's kind of like you're here for long enough, it's kind of inevitable because, you know, they're... Um, they're around, so to speak, but I decided that I wanted to tell you um, a story about this girl that I used to know or that I used to date, um, not mentioning any specifics, obviously, but she's not in this country anymore, um, which I'm kind of happy about. She lives in Australia these days. I think she's married down there, uh, and I think she's happy, which is very good, but um, when we first met... I was kind of new in this country. I would have been 25 or 26. Um, she was, I think, 31 at the time. And I was invited to this house party downtown um, in this, this penthouse apartment. Um, and it was really hot. It gets really hot here uh, in the summers. Went out on the balcony and she was out there smoking. So we started talking um, and we decided to go on a date together. And we ended up, you know, being a couple. But... Um, you could sort of tell that she was, I guess, the Japanese equivalent of street smart. She'd, she'd been around, you know, um, and, and seen some shit, so to speak, but didn't know any specifics. I just really enjoyed being around her because she was so positive and, and bubbly and, and happy all the time. Always laughing, um, always cooking. She loved to cook. She was a, a nutritionist and she, she knew all these things about food and she always wanted to make you something. Um, it was just, you know, a, a complete joy to be around her. But um, um, she was from Izuka, which is this region of the island of Kyushu, which is where I live, um, that is known for being like the most controlled or infested by the Yakuza of, I think, any region in the entire country. I've lived um, on Kyushu pretty much for as long as I've been in Japan. It's the southern island. It's sort of in between Tokyo and Okinawa, so it's kind of like... Um, really hot and tropical, at least in the summers. Uh, it gets really rural. We have a couple of major cities. I live in the, the largest one, Fukuoka, which is where um, Evo Japan was held a couple of years back. And then like uh, a couple of other major towns, Kumamoto is like two hours down south from here. And then that's where Aria, you know, the blasted salami lives. Um, but Izuka is up north and it's known for being, you know, just um, overrun by... Um, organized crime and they run you know casinos up there and if you have a small business or you run you know a shop or whatever a restaurant up there um, everybody knows that you know every month you make certain payments to certain local organizations to you know um, keep you safe uh, and sort of you know keep things running it's it's that kind of a thing um, and one day 
Um, I didn't know much about this back then, but I decided that I wanted to go to the aquarium together. We have a great aquarium here in the city. Um, it's the kind of thing I love where you can walk in these tunnels, you know, underwater and look at, you know, jellyfish and sharks. And, and it's just a great day out and it's really beautiful. Um, and uh, we went on this date. We had a great day. And when we walked out, we walked down onto the beach and we sat down in the sand and we were talking. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she kind of just opened up uh, about her life before she met me. And she told me that uh, years ago, she was the, the girlfriend, the, the woman of one of the sort of major high up um, guys in one of the main organizations here in the South. And they met when she was uh, 24. I think he was 65 at the time in just some random bar up in Izuka. But, you know, he was... Wealthy, cool-looking, well-respected, wore a, a, a cool suit, and he was all, you know, charming and stuff. And so they got to talking, and they ended up dating. But pretty much as soon as she moved into his place, things got really weird and really violent. He wouldn't let her go out at night. Uh, he would accuse her of being, you know... Uh, messing around with other guys she was basically required to be around to uh, cook and clean for him and and take care of him um, all the time and she wasn't really allowed to see her friends or even see her family or her mother anymore she was basically almost like a domestic pet um, and he got very violent when she talked about you know wanting to go outside or going to see her family he would become angry and he would do all kinds of horrible things to her and he told me uh, or she told me this story of like one time where she said you know my mother's ill and i really want to go to see her so i'm just gonna go uh and it was uh past seven o'clock at night apparently seven o'clock at night was when she had to be back and couldn't go out anymore and he said well i'll take you then in, in the car i'll drive you over but as they're in the car he gets more and more angry and he starts just um beating the shit out of her basically as she's sitting in the passenger seat um and she asks to be let out of the car and he starts talking about how all the clothes you're wearing and all the things you have are things that i've bought for you so if you're going to get out of the car then i'm going to have them back and he tears all of her clothes off um punching her in the face he broke her nose and basically she steps out of the car in the middle of the road wearing nothing but her um underwear uh, and covered in blood from a broken nose um, and manages to walk over in that state to the local police station uh, and talk to the police officers uh, and explain the situation and um, this is the reason that I don't have a lot of respect for Japanese law enforcement anymore and while I don't while why I don't why I try and have as little to do as possible with Japanese authorities anymore. It's one of the many reasons, but um, they basically realized who she was and who she was dating, and so they kind of just put her in one of their cars and they drove her back to him. She never got to um, see her mother th that night. Um, but uh, what eventually happened is, you know, he was old and he got really sick. It turned out that he had cancer, and um, as he got... Uh, worse he became apparently very sort of um meek and humble and and started to you know ask her for for favors and 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 told her how much she meant and how much he loved her and became kind of like this pathetic sort of um we have a saying in sweden but it kind of means you know when when the devil grows old he turns religious it's kind of like you know you start regretting and and and, and becoming more mild in your later years but um uh one day he goes to the uh the bathroom to have a bath you know japanese people culturally have a bath every night uh, before they go to bed and uh, she realizes that it's been like a long time before he, he came back so eventually she goes into the bathroom to have a look and he's kind of you know sunk beneath the surface uh and is under the water and can't really breathe and she told me how like uh, it was like a, a million years passed as she stood there thinking about whether or not she was just gonna leave him um and call it an accident but 
um, and this shows you the, the the measure of the woman. She eventually pulled him out, and she was a registered nurse as well, and, and she knew CPR and everything, so she helped him out, and he survived. But um, eventually, um, a couple of weeks later, she came home one day, and he had tried to make food for himself, turned on the oven, um, he couldn't really cook, and he'd fallen down in front of the oven with his legs sort of towards it, and the oven heating up has sort of uh, had sort of burnt his leg really badly, and his his trousers were charred, and his flesh had like really te terrible burns uh, on it. So he was rushed to the hospital with an ambulance, but at that point, you know, he was already really sick with cancer, and um, and he passed away from that. And then essentially, she was free and could go back to her family and sort of you know rediscover her life and 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 and, and you know do things again. But what she decided to do was she became a person who, and this is also so extremely cool. I'm like, I'm so inspired by <laughs> all the people in my life are so much more um, like cool and inspirational than I am that I feel pathetic by comparison. But she decided to start working um, for a company that rehabilitates um, prisoners, uh, criminals that come out of prison and then try and reintegrate themselves in society. So say, for example, you, you get locked up for doing something really bad for like 10 years. When you come out, if you're going to be able to have a life, then you need to try and get a job. You need to sort of get somewhere to live. Um, your family might not be interested in talking to you anymore. And so she worked for an organization that helped people like that. And because she was a trained nutritionist, she also, you know, specifically helped them with like, you know, uh, getting them food every day and whatever. So she lived in this big apartment building out in the middle of nowhere in the countryside where the, uh, the, the top floor apartment was hers, but then everybody else who lived in, the, in this apartment building was kind of a halfway house for criminals that the company that she worked for were looking after. And she asked me if I wanted to come out there and stay at her place. So we went out there one weekend and we drove up to this building and all of these, I mean, as far as, you know, to me, they looked very shady. People are standing around smoking and talking and she comes out and she's all like, hey, how's everybody doing? And there was this guy who was staring at me, you know, smoking a cigarette by the, the entrance. And I, you know, said hi. And she said, you know, this is my boyfriend, you know, be cool and everything. And as we went up to her apartment, I asked her, that guy smoking by the door, who was he? What did he do? You know, as a joke. And she was like, oh, he stabbed his brother to death. But um, <laughs> it was a long time ago and he feels really bad about it, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, we were together for uh, for a while, but we ended up breaking up and it had nothing to do with, you know, her past what she did for a living she just really really liked to party a lot um in the weekends she used to go to nightclubs and hang out with her friends and you know get uh you know go wild and have a lot of fun and then come back to my place you know at 5 a.m but then i had to get up you know at 8 a.m to go to work so it's just like our lifestyles didn't jive at all at that point so eventually it fell apart but um, the really cool thing about her is that she would take me around to different parts of Japan. We would walk down, you know, um, in shopping malls or down back alleys and streets and restaurants or, or summer festivals. We went to a fireworks festival and she would sort of point out to me all the parts that were actually run or maintained by the Yakuza. She would explain to me um, what what. Um, what fees, what money they have to pay to certain authorities, how those authorities are integrated uh, with organized crime and how, that, uh, how it all actually sort of works uh, underneath the surface and behind it all, which was so fascinating. I saw a completely different side of this country um, thanks to her. Uh, she sort of introduced me to all of it. And so I guess that's where uh, uh, my rosy colored goggles about... Um, Japan sort of started to fall off in a serious way for the first time as much as I love this country you know you you live anywhere for long enough I bet I mean even if you live in the country you were born and you've been there for a while at this point and you probably have all these opinions about how it how it's wrong and how it could be better it's just that sort of a thing but um, we kept in touch 
uh, she went away to Australia. She met some really cool, um, taller, more beautiful sort of surfer dude. Um, and I think they're still together and I think they're very happy. So that's great. Um, but yeah, for some reason, I, I, I felt like I wanted to tell that story. I felt like you might be interested, but that is going to conclude um, this episode of Frames Bar. This time, I genuinely didn't prepare anything. I didn't have like any script or, or any ideas even going in. So it's probably the, the rambliest thing I've made so far. But um, if it was enjoyable enough to you, then let me know and maybe we'll do more like this. If not, uh, maybe I'll tighten it uh, up for the next one, you know. Uh, and make sure I have a m more uh, fighting game related, you know, actually thought out topics for the next one. But in any case, I'm going to keep doing this because I enjoy it. It means a lot to me and it means a lot to me that some of you out there listen. And unlike that character design um, tier list video that fell apart because of the response, maybe this is something long form that somebody out there will actually listen to to help them calm down a little bit and all the craziness that is going on all around us. If that's the case, if that's the case for a single person, then you know, this was time well spent. Um, thank you so very much for listening and I'll talk to you guys again very soon.